Thank you, Bonnie and Marion and Art. We are grateful for your help as always. Amen? Amen. I don't say it enough, but there it is. Proverbs chapter 3 is where we're going to spend a little bit of time this morning. If you've got your Bible and you want to join me, I'd be grateful. Proverbs chapter 3. When my dad was dying with cancer, we, uh, we took shifts, and I took the midnight shift for a long time, and um, <clears throat> gave me the ability to get stuff done during the day, and then spend time at the house to help. And uh, I remember one night, and it was nearing the end, and I spent, <clears throat> he was in the bed at that time, and not out in the, in the hospital bed in the living room. Uh, he was, was still able to get him in the bed, but uh, somewhere during the middle of the night, I just began to tell him thank you for everything that he'd ever done. He was he was completely out of it in morphine, and I thought he he ain't gonna know a word that I'm saying, and and I just <coughs> poured out my heart, and he was working with his fingers and just as he was doing and just muttering, jabbering stuff that was just senseless, just nothing made sense, he just jabbering. And, and I just sat there probably for an hour and a half, and I just walked through all the things in my life that I could possibly think of and remember, and everything I, from the infancy that, that I can remember till, till then, thanking him for this. Thank you, Dad, for that. Thank you for showing me how to do this. Thank you for being there with me for that. And just do all of it. I was thinking about that the other day, and... Uh, Father's Day coming up and uh, how we say thank you and you know I tried to tell him through his life but there at the end I, I wanted to make sure he didn't get out of the world without me saying thank you. Not everybody gets that opportunity. Some fathers go out in a car wreck or industrial accident or whatever, fall over with a heart attack and you don't get those moments. Those who do sometimes don't, don't always use the moments like they should, and some of us wait to the last minute. But at any rate, we are today, it's Father's Day, across America saying thank you, and some of it's kind of late, but we're getting around to say it. Father's Day, uh, if I could share with you, goes back to the year 1909. There was a woman by the name of Sonora Dodd who was sitting in church like you, and she was in Spokane, Washington, and the preacher was preaching a Mother's Day sermon. And he's waxing eloquent on all the virtues of mothers like he should have. But here sat a woman who is now pregnant with her own first child. And uh, her memories are not about so much her mother. Her memories are about her dad because her mother died early in childbirth. And uh, uh, she was 16 years old when her mother died. And she remembered how her dad didn't remarry, but he kept the family together and did everything. He had dual roles. He, he was serving as mother and father to the kids, kept them fed and the laundry done and all, everything that needed to be done. The older kids had to pitch in and help raise the younger kids as well. There were six siblings, and uh, her mama died and left her dad in a lurch, really. So on that Sunday morning as she's hearing the preacher talk about mothers, she's thinking really about her dad and how he did a masterful job to raise those kids. So she went to the preacher afterwards and said, you know, I would really like it if you would bring a message on fathers. And my father's going to have a birthday next month in June, and would you be gracious enough to preach on fathers too? Well, that started the ball rolling, and, and uh, it took a long time for it to catch on. And eventually, finally, in the year 1972, President Nixon signed some paperwork to make it official the third Sunday in June would be Father's Day. And it uh, took a long time for him to get around to honoring fathers. We'd, mothers come a whole lot sooner. But uh, however it happens, aren't we glad it happened? And we look back and say... Thank you. Proverbs chapter 3, Solomon is giving a lot of instructions to his children. If you turn the page and go back to chapter 1, Proverbs 1, verse 1, 
The introduction to the whole book of Proverbs, it says the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel. And it begins to tell us what his father passed on to him. I am my father's son, and this is what my father taught me. And then in no time, he begins to tell his children and instruct them as he was taught himself. Chapter 1, verse 8, he says, My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother, for they shall be an ornament of grace about thy head and chains about thy neck. Verse 10, My son. If sinners entice thee, don't go with them. Don't go along with them. Don't listen to them. Get away from them. Chapter 1, verse 15. My son, walk now, not thou in the way with them. Refrain thy foot from their path. Chapter 2, verse 1. My son, if thou wilt receive my words and hide my commandments with thee. Chapter 3, verse 1. My son, forget not... My law, but let thine heart keep my commandments. Verse 11, my son, despise not the chastening of the Lord, neither be weary of his correction. For whom the Lord loveth, he correcteth, even as a father the son in whom he delighteth. Verse 21, my son, let not them depart from thine eyes, keep sound wisdom and discretion. Chapter 4, verse 1. Hear ye children the instruction of a father and attend to no understanding. Verse 10. My, hear my son. Receive my sayings and the years of thy life shall be many. I have taught thee in the way of wisdom. I have led thee in the right paths. Chapter 5, verse 1. My son, attend unto my wisdom and bow thine ear to my understanding. Chapter 6, verse 1, My son, if thou be a surety for thy friend. Chapter 7, verse 1, My son, keep my words and lay up my commandments with thee. I think you get the, get the idea at this point. He is, early on, he is directing all of this instruction to his children. I want you to learn, as my father taught me, I am passing it on to you. And you know, that is... The same way with fathers. The way we were raised, the model we saw, is typically the way we want to raise our kids as well because that's the way we learned it, so we pass it on as well. The difference is uh, our instruction, our wisdom is not, is not uh, published and goes around the world like Solomon's. People are still reading the book of Proverbs and should be around the world. But dads, most dads, they wonder, is anybody even listening in the house, let alone it being published in the community? We wonder, is there anybody even paying any attention to what we're saying? There's times where we wonder, like, might as well go out there and talk to that tree, get more response. I think all dads have been there. Kind of like the doting father that uh, he was trying to help his wife. They had little kids, and uh, by the end of the day, she is just wore out. So he said, I'll put the kids to bed, and I will pray with them every night, and that's be my, one of the things that I'll help you with. So he would sing them a lullaby as well, and he had two or three picked out, and he had memorized them, and he knew them, so they wasn't always the same song every night. And he did that every night, and he'd pray with them until one night he heard his little four-year-old say to the other little girl, the daughter he had, he, she whispered, said, if you pretend like you're asleep, he'll just quit singing. <laughs> <laughs> that ended the lullabies. Well, dads have been passing on instruction and, and uh, guidance for years. Clear back. Clear back, I think, to the first family. I think that Adam did his best to pass on to his boys, his family, the wisdom that he got from God the Father walking with God in the cool of the day. In the garden, he tried to pass it on to his children, and you and I know that that first family was kind of dysfunctional, wasn't it? I mean, those boys grew up, and it didn't go according to plan, did it? Even from the beginning, and there's a lot of fathers who poured their heart into it, trying to raise kids, and it didn't go well either. And we uh, live with regrets and say, I wish that would have been different. Well, it happened early on in the garden, didn't it? The best thing that we know is that God's word is true. 
God's ways are best. So as Solomon passed on to his to his children, so we try to pass on to them. And he shared with them the best advice any father could give a daughter or a son. Trust in the Lord with what? All your heart. All, give, it, give God all your heart. And don't be trying to figure out how to do it just alone yourself. Lean not unto thine own understanding, but in everything you do, acknowledge Him. Everything you do, it doesn't matter what it is, acknowledge God and He will direct thy paths. That is the best counsel that any dad could give. Verse 4, he said, Thou shalt find favor and good understanding in the sight of God and man. And when I was reading of that, my mind immediately went to Luke chapter 2, verse 52, reading about the life of Jesus growing up as a child himself. It says that he grew up and uh, gained in favor with God and man. Same, same scripture right here, Proverbs 3, 4. You'll find that exactly lived out in the life of Jesus. He grew in wisdom and stature in favor with God and man. That's what we hope people to do. It's not just one-dimensional. If we just teach our kids how to grow up in favor of man, we've missed the mark, haven't we? It's not just about that. It's about this relationship with God as well. Solomon is driving this home. It's not just about this life. It's about a relationship with God. All good fathers will try, 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 try to impress that upon their kids. Well, this morning I want to do something a little bit different I've never done before. If you look in your bulletin, you find over here on this page a little acrostic for the word father. This morning I'm going to do something different I've never done ever. I don't even think I've tried this in a Bible study is to uh, take the word father apart and assign a word to each one of the letters as an acrostic other preachers perhaps have done this. I never have. Next, next year, well, I've been preaching 40 years. I started in 1982. And, and Robin says, it don't seem like a day over 60 years. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, I want to try this. Really want to do. And my words that I come up with that came to me, probably completely different than what somebody else would do, but it's what the Lord gave me, so I want to try this. The letter F, if you've got a pencil, write this down. It's the, I, I put down the word faithful. The word faithful. Fathers need to be faithful, don't they? Paul writing to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2 said, Moreover, it is required that a steward be found faithful. Now, a steward is somebody who doesn't own something, but he is taking good care of it and he is responsible for it. Whether it's assets or, or uh, wealth or whatever he's managing, he is required to be accountable to it. If he does a good job, he'll be rewarded. If he doesn't do a good job, he'll be disciplined. Fathers, can I remind you and remind myself at the same time, we are stewards. We are stewards of the marriage. We're steward of the home. We're steward of our children. We don't own our family. We, we bring those kids into the world and they be named after us and they may look like us and embarrassingly at times they act like us. <laughs> but the truth is we don't own them because all life belongs to God. Amen. All life. You, you, I've heard people say, well, that's my kid. Yes, that's right. But truly, in, in, in reality... That child belongs to God. And uh, when, when we dedicate children, what do we do? We bring them to the Lord and we say, Lord, I give it back to you. I'm going to pray your blessings over this child. But Father, we acknowledge this life belongs to you. And it has a soul. And we're going to do everything we can to raise them up in the right way. So that someday that soul will live with you eternally. We are stewards. The marriage, and someday we'll give an account for our marriage and our kids and all, and uh, God help us. We are called to be faithful to the vows, to our spouse, to our kids, to the home. Sadly, some people say, you know, if it don't work out well, then, then I'm just going to go find a better deal down the street. And sometimes they will, sadly, 
tell the rest of the family, well, you know, I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave. Well, you, don't do that. Don't ever do that. I've, I've counseled young couples who say, don't ever tell your spouse or your kids, well, I'm just going to leave. Don't do that. Don't threaten them with that. That is as demoralizing as it comes. You rule that out and say to yourself, I have no option. I have to make it work. I have no chance. I have no other options. I am in it. And I'm going to stay in it. And whatever it takes, however hard it is, I'm going to make this work. We're called to be faithful. Number two, the word A, I come up with the word attitude. And we ought to have a really good attitude. Chuck Swindoll said something that I want to try to quote to you. He said, the longer I live, the more I realize the impact of attitude on life. Attitude to me is more important than facts. It's more important than the past, more important than your education or money or circumstances or failure or success. It is more important than our appearance or giftedness or skill. It can make or break a company, a church, or a home. The remarkable thing is that every day we have a choice regarding our attitude and how we will embrace the day. We cannot change our past, nor can we change the fact of how people will act. We cannot change the inevitable. The only thing that we can do is play the one string we have, and that is our attitude. And I am convinced that life is 10% of what happens to me and 90% of how I react to it. And so it is with you. We are in charge of our attitudes. And I read this week one theologian who said, God chooses what we go through. We choose how we go through. Our attitude matters. Philippians chapter 4, Paul said, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are good report, if there be any virtue, meaning if they're noteworthy or, or worthy or admirable, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, what? Think on these things. Why? Because out of that becomes our attitude and how we look at life. And if we, if we come into the house with a spirit of peace and joy and love, it tends to permeate out throughout the whole home that we put that same spirit on the family, the spouse, kids, all. If we come in uptight and worried and mad and frustrated, we can, we can put that same spirit on everybody in the house. Our attitude matters because it catches. T, the letter T. Art told me I spelled this wrong. He looked at it and he said, you spelled it wrong. And I went, fear went through me. I thought, oh, I'm all the time making grammatical errors in the bulletin. Even with spell check, I still. And he said, no, 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 you spelled it wrong. Instead of the H, it's supposed to be Another T, F-A-T-T-E-R, because after the ice cream social, we'll all be fatter. <laughs> <laughs> oh, the letter T, I can't help it. I put down time. If there's any regret, regrets that I have as a father, it's this issue right here. That I did not spend enough time with my kids the way I should have. I tried, like all fathers do, I tried. And uh, there's moments where we were, we just had a wonderful time, and then there's times I was off doing this with the church, or off doing that, trying to help somebody, when I probably should have been spending time with the kids, and they have let me know that. Dad, you weren't there. You weren't there. That's, that is one regret that I live with. Time is the most important aspect of our lives. It is the commodity of life that is getting away from us, isn't it? You turn around and say, where did, that, where did all that time go? There's a little poem that I, I heard years ago. I don't know if it's a poem, but a saying. And I had to Google it to find it because I forgot half of it. Perhaps you heard this. It says, when I was a child, I laughed and wept. Time crept. When as a youth, I dreamed and talked time walked. When I became a full-grown man, time ran. And soon I shall find in traveling on, time gone. We, 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 uh, 
We learn that much too late, don't we? And this is the one aspect that it's years later we look back and we realize, whoops, 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 whoops. There's no substitute for time. There's no alternative. You know, years ago they used to about talk to parents about quality time, that you could do this and do this and this and scrimp on time with your kids because what time you was give them if, if you made it quality time. Well, that is really wrong because kids don't know the difference between quality time and just time. All they know is dad took time. Mom took time. Grandma and grandpa took time. They, they can't make the difference. All they know is it's just time. Francis Adams, Charles Francis Adams, the son of John Quincy Adams, the sixth president of the United States, followed in the footsteps of his dad, became a politician, was in much demand speaking. He was a historian, uh, editor. He worked for Harvard. I mean, he, he was a diplomat to Great Britain. The man was all the time busy going, always in demand. But he kept a diary, and it's very telling that in one of the entries on one day, he put the day's activities. He wrote, went fishing with my son today, and then he hyphened it out, and he put, a wasted day. A wasted day. Well, unbeknownst to his son, who also kept a diary and never knew what his dad was thinking, really, he kept a diary and somewhere along the way somebody crossed this day with that day of two diaries. The father said, spent the day fishing with my son, a wasted day. But in his son's diary, he wrote, went fishing with my father today, the most wonderful day of my life. Isn't that, isn't that incredible? Two different perspectives. Psalm says in Psalm 90 verse 12, teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Good parents make the most of the time we have. And we learn from it. The letter H, I put down the word help. Good dads show up, roll up their shirt sleeves, and help. <laughs> even when we're not physically able to, or maybe we don't even know what we're doing, but we still want to try and help. I was at the gas station with Robin a couple weeks ago, and I'm looking across the parking lot, and there was a scene that was very familiar to me. There's a young gal there, and I... I had to count two or three times because these little kids keep moving. She had three little kids, you know, staggered down in height. And uh, the, the father, it's obvious, the father is there. He's a young guy. She looks, they're, they're both early 20s perhaps. And uh, there's others there in the picture too. And uh, there's an older gentleman there, and he is changing a flat tire on the car. And he's got the floor jack out. He's brought it in his truck. His truck's parked there by their little car. And he's jacked the car up. He changes the tire. And I watch him as he puts the floor jack back in there. And then I notice a striking resemblance between the woman that was with him, the older man, and the daughter that has to ask to be a mother and daughter. And I say, here's dad. Dad has come to the rescue. She's got a flat tire. Here's the son, the young, or the, the husband, he's early 20s. He ain't got a clue. He, he's not about changing the tire. And dad shows up in spite of the fact. And I watched them when they're done. He puts the jack away, puts his tools away. There's hugs. He hugs the little kids. He gets in the truck. They get in the car. My mind went back. I can't help it. My mind went back to when my girls, our girls were driving, just driving, and I got them these little Ford Rangers, uh, economical. I, I bought them Rangers, because little trucks, because I didn't want a car, situation with a carload of kids and teenagers and, and what could happen there. I said, no, maybe one person, and you can't haul a bunch of them in the bed of the truck. No, that's out. <laughs> but I remember with both of them, I put them, brought them over to the cement slab there in our driveway, and I made them, I taught them how to jack up that little truck and take a wheel off, put it back on in case they ever had a flat tire. I didn't want them to be just disabled along the road someplace or have to rely on somebody or be helpless. I said, you're going to learn how to change a tire because I don't want you vulnerable out there. Being a girl, uh, you need to know how to do this. 
the day may come that you're out there alone and it may happen. Dads are forever wanting to give help. Sometimes that help comes in words and advice and counsel. Sometimes it comes in just doing it. But it doesn't matter how it shows up. On the other end, the kids are always interpreting it as help. And we're grateful for it. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, Let us not be weary in helping. No, he said in well-doing. Same thing. For in due season we shall reap if we faint not, meaning that someday they grow up and they can do it themselves. And then one day we look back and say, I got a cup that I pulled off the shelf and looked at this morning. It's laying on my desk. Um, well, our youngest daughter gave it to me a number of years ago. It says, it's a coffee cup, it says, Thanks, Dad, you did a great job. I turned out awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, a little tongue-in-cheek. We always want to give help. The, the, the next letter, E, and i got to move on. You, you, you know, when you've got six letters, that's a six-point out, mm -hmm. outline. The letter E, uh, right along with what one of you shared this morning, is the word encouragement. Encouragement. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29 says, Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, building up, that it may minister grace unto the hearers. If you look at the thought in your bulletin, it says there are only two lasting bequests we hope to give our children. One is roots, the other is wings. That comes, both of them, from encouragement, building them up, saying, I know you can make it, and, and you, can, uh, you, can, you can live through this, and you'll be all right, and you'll be stronger for it, and, and I'm here to help you, and we encourage them all along the way. That helps their self-esteem and to believe it when they're out there and we're not with them, that they can face life because we were there helping them and encouraging them. That they're capable of bigger things and better things because Dad made a difference. I've probably shared this before, but uh, I'll share it again. It's one of the greatest Father's Day thoughts that, I, that ever goes through my head. And it's about a good friend by the name of Pinky. And I, I probably told you half a dozen times he grew up in Florida when he was, uh, you know, kid. I don't remember him saying much about mom, but he talked about his dad all the time. And the, him and his brothers were working on cars before they were allowed to drive cars. And they were always tearing motors down or building stuff and fixing stuff and all the time. When he was 16 years old and he had daddy's car, patrolman pulled him over for drag racing, took him and hauled him to jail locked him up in a little town, and everybody knew everybody, and the patrolman knew him. He knew that car. He knew it was his dad's car. He knew it wasn't his dad. There's no way his dad would be doing that. And uh, he hauled him off to jail, and he's going to make an example out of him because he's going to call his dad, and his dad's going to come down there and beat the tar out of him for drag racing. And he just couldn't wait to see it happen right there in, the, in uh, jail. Locked him up, called his dad told him he pulled, got his son down there, called the other, the other parents as well, notified them. I think he said that it uh, took, took Dad a long time to show up. Dad came into the jail to bail him out, get him out and take him home. Patrolman is just gloating. He's just waiting to see this kid get his come up. And his dad walks in, they bring him out, and in front of the officer, his dad says, Son, I only got one question. He said, did you win? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Pinky left and said, yeah, Dad, I did. He said, fine, let's go home, son. <laughs> paid, the, paid the guy, took him home. Pinky said, we had a long talk on the way home. He said, I never did that again. I never dragged race. But Pinky and his brothers raced for years. They had race cars, and they were on the circuit. And, but he said, we kept it on the track, never on the road. I think the kids need encouragement most when they've failed, when they've hit the wall, when uh, they've really 
really done stuff that embarrassed them and embarrassed the family. I think that's when they need encouragement the most. Pinky's dad taught him a very valuable lesson, and we could as well. Encouragement goes a long, long way. A good word on a, on a, on a hard day can carry a, good, a kid for years and years. They'll live off that for a long time, and the next time they hit a problem, that'll come back to them, and they'll give them the courage to keep going. The last letter, and I gotta wrap this up, is the letter R, and I just wrote the word relationship. Not a whole lot to say there, but relationship. And if you take the word faithful, and the word a good attitude, and time, and help, and encouragement, and put them all together, you can build a good relationship. And you can have a relationship that will span the years of time. And the son or daughter will be so grateful. Now, if time got away from you, you're still here and you still have opportunity, you can always work on that relationship, as most of us are. We're still trying. Our daughter and her husband was, came and spent the day with us yesterday. And every time they come, I'm always, and I've shared this before, I'm always praying in advance, Lord, what can I say this time, this, this time together, what can I say to make a difference in their life right now? And the Lord led me to give her a picture, and on the back of the little picture of her, I wrote something, and I, and I prayed her, about, what, Lord, what can I, and I wrote her a word of encouragement, and at the right time, I gave it to her. And she laughed at the picture. It was comical of her at a younger period in her life. And I said, but turn it over and read the back. Because that's the message I wanted her to get. Every time you see your kids, try to say something to impact their life. Every opportunity you get, say something that will help them. Your job's not done. If you're still alive, there's still work to do. And there's still opportunity that God has given us to pour into their life to make a difference. Amen? Amen. Well, it's Father's Day. God bless all you fathers. We're so proud of you, and uh, we just want to brag on you that you made a difference. Whether you realize it or not, or sometimes you may feel like, well, I am under condemnation. No, you're not. God bless you for making a difference. There, there are some little gifts that uh, the church has got for all the fellas, and uh, Nancy's going to hand them out here as we uh, part ways here with the end of this service, but she wants to put it in the hands of all the dads, and that's just a little something from the church, and we want to say thank you for doing a good job. Well, I'm going to ask you to stand. We're going to close the service. If somebody would like to pray, if there's a need in your life, if there's something that uh, you would just like to have help with, I'm going to be here for a little while. We'll, we'll find a quiet place and pray. And uh, you just, we'll just give it to Jesus. There's a burden on your heart. Don't, don't leave without giving it to the Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these moments together. We thank you for all the men and for the heritage that they have left for their families. But Father, we know that our work's not done, so Lord, help us. We can't do what we used to be able to do, but what we can do now, may we continue to do it to the best of our ability, and God, give us grace. Bless our homes. Bless our children. Bless our grandchildren. And in some cases here today, bless the great-grandchildren. Keep us faithful to you and faithful to our families. And we will do that, Lord, with your help. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 God bless you all. Thank you for being here today.